Saint Augustine commentary on the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 48 to 59, following. And then, after such an insult, this was all that he said of his own glory. But I honor, said he, my father, and you dishonor me. That is, I honor not myself, that you may not think me arrogant. I have one to honor, and did you recognize me, just as I honor the Father, so would you also honor me. I do what I ought, you do not what you ought. And I, said he, seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeks and judges. Whom does he wish to be understood but the Father? How then does he say in another place, The Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son? Why, here he says, I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeks and judges. If then the Father judges, how is it that he judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son? In order to solve this point, attend. It may be solved by quoting a similar mode of speaking. You have it written, God tempts not any man. James chapter 1 verse 13 And again, you have it written, the Lord your God tempts you to know whether you love him. Deuteronomy chapter 13 verse 3 Just the point in dispute, you see. For how does God tempt not any man, and how does the Lord your God tempt you to know whether you love him? It is also written, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. 1 John, 1 John chapter 4 verse 18 And in another place it is written, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Psalm 19 verse 9 We are to understand then that there are two kinds of temptation, one that deceives, the other that proves. As regards that which deceives, God tempts not any man. As regards that which proves, the Lord your God tempts you, that he may know whether you love him. But here again also, there arises another question. How he tempts that he may know, from whom, prior to the temptation, nothing can be hid. It is not that God is ignorant, but that it is said that he may know, that is, that he may make you to know. Such modes of speaking are found both in our ordinary conversation and in writers of eloquence. Let me say a word on our style of conversation. We speak of a blind ditch, not because it has lost its eyes, but because by lying hid it makes us blind to its existence. One speaks of bitter lupins, that is, sore, not that they themselves are bitter, but because they occasion bitterness to those who taste them. <clears throat> and so there are also expressions of this sort in Scripture. Those who take the trouble to attain a knowledge of such points have no trouble in solving, in solving them. And so the Lord your God tempts you that he may know. What is this that he may know? That he may make you to know, if you love him. Job was unknown to himself, but he was not unknown to God. He led the tempter into Job and brought him to a knowledge of himself. What, then, are the two fears? There is a servile fear and there is a clean, chaste fear. 
There is the fear of suffering punishment. There is another fear of losing righteousness. That fear of suffering punishment is slavish. What great thing is it to fear punishment? The vilest slave and the cruelest robber do so. It is no great thing to fear punishment, but great it is to love righteousness. Has he then who loves righteousness no fear? Certainly he has. Not of incurring of punishment, but of losing righteousness. My brethren, assure yourselves of it, and draw your inference from that which you love. Someone of you is fond of money. Can I find anyone, think you, who is not so? Yet from this very thing which he loves, he may understand my meaning. He is afraid of loss. Why is he so? Because he loves money. In the same measure that he loves money, is he afraid of losing it? So then, someone is found to be a lover of righteousness, who at heart is much more afraid of its loss, who dreads more being stripped of his righteousness, than you of your money. This is the fear that is clean, this the fear that endures for ever. It is not this that love makes away with, or casts out, but rather embraces it, and keeps it with it, and possesses it as a companion. For we come to the Lord that we may see him face to face. And there it is this pure fear that preserves us, for such a fear as that does not disturb but reassure. The adulterous woman fears the coming of her husband, and the chaste one fears her husband's departure. Therefore, as according to one kind of temptation, God tempts not any man, but according to another, the Lord your God tempts you, and according to one kind of fear, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. But according to another, the fear of the Lord is clean and during forever. So also in this passage, according to one kind of judgment, the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son, and according to another, I, said he, seek not mine own glory, there is one that seeks and judges. This point may also be sought from the word from the word itself. You have been all judgment spoken of in the gospel. He that believes not is judged. Already, and in another place, the hour is coming when those who are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they have done evil unto the resurrection of judgment. You see how he has put judgment for condemnation and punishment. And yet if judgment were always to be taken for condemnation, should we ever have heard in the psalm, Judge me, O God? In the former place, judgment is used in the sense of inflicting pain. Here, it is used in the sense of discernment. How so? Just because so expounded by him who says, Judge me, O God, for read and see what follows. What is this judge me, O God? <coughs> but just what he adds and discern, my cause against an unholy, an unholy nation. Psalm 63 verse 1 Because then it was said, Judge me, O God, and discern the true merits of my cause against an unholy nation. Similarly, now said the Lord Christ, I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeks and judges. <coughs> How is there one that seeks and judges? There is the Father 
who discerns and distinguishes between my glory and yours. For your glory in the spirit of this present world, not so I, not so do I, who say to the Father, Father, glorify you, me, with that glory which I had with you before the world was. John chapter 17, verse 5. What is that glory? You, me, with that glory that I had with you before the world was. What is that glory? One altogether different from human inflation. Thus does the Father judge, and so to judge is to discern. And what does he discern? The glory of his Son from the glory of mere men. For to that end is it said, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. Psalm 45, verse 7. For not because he became man is he now to be compared with us. We as men are sinful, he is sinless. We as men inherit from Adam both death and delinquency. He received from the virgin mortal flesh, but no iniquity. In fine, neither because we wish it are we born, nor as long as we wish it do we live, nor in the way that we wish it to do we die, but he before he was born chose of whom he should be born. At his birth he brought about the adoration of the Magi. He grew as an infant and showed himself God by his miracles and surpassed man in his weakness. Lastly, it shows also the manner of his death, that is, to be hung on the cross and to fasten the cross itself on the foreheads of believers, so that the Christian may say, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. On the very cross, when he pleased, he made his body be taken down and departed. In the very sepulchre, as long as it pleased him, he lay, and when he pleased, he arose as from a bed. So then, brethren, in respect to his very form as a servant, for who can speak of that other form as it ought to be spoken of? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. In respect, I say, to his very form as a servant, the difference is great between the glory of Christ and 